morning. It's good to see you here this morning. It's not a uh, it's not a long. Uh, not a long drive uh, at all uh, to uh, the church building, but you know, uh, just a just a short ride here. You see the the many who are out walking their dogs and uh, washing their cars, and getting ready to uh, mow their lawns. Uh, just a quick uh, pass of the gas station on the corner. You can see the boats and the mud splattered trucks on their way to whatever uh, recreation they'll be involved in today. Uh, so certainly uh, it is good to see you all here uh, in faithfulness, uh, just gathering together as the Assembly of the Saints uh, to worship our Lord uh, this day. And uh, in the great hope uh, that the word of the Lord uh, will reach others and let them know about this great fellowship of this family of God that gathers together bodily to uh, come together as brothers and sisters and worship the Lord because it's a beautiful thing. Amen. And uh, you just don't know what they're missing, yeah. even in a small gathering. Uh, the power of the Lord is present, and uh, we are grateful for it. So let's go to our uh, great Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, we thank you, O oh God, for bringing us uh, together this day. Uh, certainly, we could be elsewhere, uh, but we thank you for your spirit uh, stirring within us, urging us uh, to come to worship you, to be together, uh, to come together as a congregation, uh, as an assembly. Uh, we just want to praise your name. We just want to bring glory to your name, honor to your name, because you are mighty God. Uh, you are great and, and loving, you are compassionate, you are sovereign, uh, so powerful. Uh, uh, your kindness, your, your gentleness, your amazing grace, and your beautiful mercy, everything uh, is just, uh, uh, we should be as your people in all, and I hope we will be. Uh, I do pray that your spirit, who brought us together this morning, would certainly uh, guide us through the study of your word this morning, and uh, that we as your people may be able to apply it to our lives, where we are in our walk, in our journey with you, because uh, certainly there's not one of us who uh, does not wish to grow closer to you. We all can all get ever nearer to you uh, in our walk. Uh, we can become ever deeper uh, in our relationship with you, may it be so. Uh, we uh, pray that you might remove the distractions from our minds and from our hearts today so that we may uh, focus on your word. And uh, uh, Lord, we also want to lift up our uh, brother Richard to you this morning. And, uh, do pray that uh, uh, the surgical team would be filled with uh, wisdom with precision uh, as uh, they uh, operate upon uh, our brother uh, this day. Uh, may all things go smoothly. May it all be successful. May there be healing. And uh, please, uh, we do pray for comfort for uh, Corinne and the rest of the family this day. Uh, we lift them up before you and put them in your wonderful hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, we are in uh, the 15th uh, chapter uh, of 1 Corinthians uh, again. And uh, we're just making our way very slowly uh, through this chapter. As you can tell, we've uh, gone through the first uh, 19 verses. We find ourselves uh, today uh, in verses 20 through 28. Um, you know, uh, you may remember at the uh, conclusion of our text uh, last time, you remember the words of Paul, you know, if, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied 
more than all men. But uh, note at the beginning of our text this morning, uh, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, uh, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Uh, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each uh, in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ when he has done this then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Uh, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his words for us this morning. Uh, if you were to go back to the uh, very first chapter of, and you don't have to, but if you were, uh, the very first chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians and the first part of verse 2, Reading from the Amplified, Paul says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, that is, to those set apart, those made holy in Christ Jesus, who are selected and called as saints, saints being God's people. This is God's people. These are believers. And so, in this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul speaking to the believers concerning the resurrection of the saints, called the resurrection of the righteous, or the first resurrection. Uh, you know, in uh, uh, God's word, you find that later on in the book of Revelation. In verses 1 through 11, uh, you'll recall we looked at those. Paul spoke of how they uh, believe in Christ's resurrection, and uh, because of that, they must therefore believe in their own resurrection, uh, both the resurrection of our Lord and our own subsequent resurrection one day in the future, they're linked. They, you know, they have to be. In verses 12 through 19 that we looked at last week, Paul shows them that there are some uh, terrible uh, repercussions if they don't believe in their own resurrection because it means that Christ himself has not risen from the dead. If the two are linked together and you uh, don't believe that we're going to rise, then it must mean, Paul says, that he, Christ himself, did not rise from the dead. And then, of course, Paul said that our preaching is in vain. And the apostles' preaching is in vain. And the evangelists and the words of the prophets of the Old Testament are all in vain because Christ is still in the grave. And so... Because of that, we will remain in the grave one day. And so, you know, Paul's talking about those terrible repercussions. You know, if all of that is true, then our faith, our very faith is in vain. Because it's an empty message. It's not worth believing in, Paul said. And then our personal faith is fruitless. And, of course, if that's the case, then uh, you know, tragically, we would still be in our sins, right? You know, the faith that... Uh, you and I exercised uh, to have our uh, sins washed away, it doesn't mean anything if Jesus is still in the grave and, you know, we wouldn't know whether his sacrifice was enough to satisfy a holy God. So there are awful, terrible repercussions if we don't believe in our own resurrection. And that's why, you know, Paul's uh, addressing uh, the church and the believers, you know, as such. You know, if Christ is not risen from the grave, then, you know, then the... You know, there's no resurrection for us. If, there's, if we don't believe there's a resurrection for us, then Christ himself has not risen. It's, it's so important. So Paul's been talking through all these negative implications and all these uh, consequences that would result if Christ was not risen and if we do not rise again as believers. And then you saw it when we began the reading of our text today there in verse 20. You know, the whole tone changes. But Christ has indeed 
been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. And so, you know, Paul's language up to this point has been, you know, somewhat different. You know, back in verses 12 through 19, you know, again, we looked at those last week. All, all those are, 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 you know, are suppositions. They're implying that the resurrection has, you know, hasn't happened. But then in verse 20, forget that. Paul's saying, no, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Well, good. Hallelujah to that. Because if Christ is not risen from the dead, then as Paul said in verse 19, uh, we are of all people uh, most to be pitied. So this is uh, this is emphatic. You know, it's it's declaring a, a truth. It's declaring a certainty. Uh, the Amplified Bible says, "But now, as things really are, Christ has in fact been raised from the dead." And so you know, we can see as believers, you know, to be certain about Christ's resurrection is to be certain about your own future resurrection it's a good thing it's a fantastic thing and, and that's Paul that's Paul's whole point boy trying to say Paul and whole uh, you know is it, not easy together you get a little tongue tied there but that is Paul's whole point of this message is what I want to say you know you can't believe that Christ rose from the dead and not believe that you too as a believer will rise from the dead the two are linked they must come together um, so you know we have to be just like he wanted the believers in Corinth to be sure and certain are we you know as a church today are, are we sure are we certain of that future resurrection in Christ you know as believers you know are you uh, persuaded uh, of this future that you have that rests upon the very fact that Jesus is alive right he is the living christ you know and that the, you know jesus is alive forevermore yeah you know this is how things really are i like that from the amplified you know christ has in fact been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep um back in uh, leviticus uh, chapter 23 uh you know I would think that many a person who's listening to a sermon, they hear Leviticus and they automatically switch off. Like, oh, he's going back there? Why would you do that? You know, but I am. Uh, you know, and back in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, we see that uh, before the Israelites harvested their crops, they were told to bring a portion, a sample of those crops and offer them to the Lord. So the harvest would go out into the field and find the crop that came to ripeness first and cut it away and carry that portion to the priest and the priest would make an offering to the Lord. Note the sequence of all these events uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, when you look back, you know, first uh, the lamb would be slain at Passover for the sins of the people, of course representing atonement, then the Sabbath, after the lamb was slain at Passover, the priest would take that first fruits and wave uh, the sheep of the first fruits before the Lord. And that was a sign to signify that the uh, entire harvest, all of it, belonged to the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, and you might recall the Lord Jesus, as John the Baptist said, is the lamb slain. Before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, the Passover Lamb delivering his people from bondage. Three days later, not on the Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, that resurrection Easter morning, God raised him from the grave for our uh, own justification. And God the Father declared uh, him to be the Son of God and indeed waved him before the world, the living Savior, to show uh, that his work was finished and, and that the harvest was coming. The harvest was coming. The first fruits of the first part of the harvest in Israel, uh, you know, that was the very first part. But there was more of the harvest to come. And what Paul is saying here, I believe, is even as Christ Jesus our Lord is the first fruits in the resurrection, the very fact and he declared it indeed it is fact 
you know, that Christ rose again is signifying that there's more of the same to come. You know, the first fruits was a sample of the saints who would be resurrected one day, and he was raised physically, bodily, and so we shall be raised bodily. I mean, praise God for that, because he lives in the power of an endless life. We will, as believers, live just like that one day as well. So uh, then in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, looking at verse 21, and uh, I think Bruce, I'll read from the Amplified, Paul says, For since it was by a man that death came into the world, it is also by a man, capital M, that the resurrection of the dead has come. So uh, the man that death came by, of course, was Adam. Uh, we know that the man who was first tempted and gave in to temptation, who disobeyed God and the curse of sin came upon well, all of us because of that. And the wages of that sin, of course, is death. And in a similar sense, by a man uh, also came the resurrection of the dead. The first Adam brought in death, but the last Adam, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, has brought in the resurrection of the dead. And uh, that's important to know. Then in verse 22, Paul says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And the, I mean, the emphasis, and I, I, and I should probably uh, look at it as such, it maybe shouldn't be that word all, uh, but rather that word in. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made uh, alive. You know, all, of course, all uh, you know people who've died in Adam are being raised all together in Christ. Um, the Lord Jesus Himself said in John chapter five, uh, verse twenty-nine, that those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be uh, condemned. All be resurrected. Uh, some will be resurrected to life. Others will be resurrected to judgment. And now, if, if that's what Paul is meaning there in verse 22, then you, know, you have to wonder why he didn't just keep using the word by, you know, that he had used back in verse 21. Uh, so, of course, we have to go to the original Greek because it's fun. All right, in the original Greek, that word by in verse 21, dia, and dia meaning through or on account of, and that's what through the man death came upon all, and through life, uh, Christ, life can come upon men and women as well. Uh, it, you know, it's the, uh, uh, it's the agency whereby it was accomplished. And when you look at verse 22, the word in that we see there, uh, that we just read, if we're looking at the Greek, is simply in is the word en. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't speak of that agency, but it's rather expressing association. Association. Now, if we're really getting picky about this, there are, uh, there's this article before the two names there. So it really, if we're going to look at it and translate it properly, looking at the original language, for as in the Adam all die, so in the Christ all will be made alive. Yes? So, you know, so what? Right? What does all that mean? Yeah? It means that when you're, you're born the first time a sinner, we're born into Adam, right? And maybe, you know, we wonder at times why we all have to, uh, you know, suffer all the sin and all the guilt because of something that Adam did way back in the Garden of Eden. And it's because he's your forefather. He's your forefather. So if you're in the Adam, that means you're still dead in your sin because it relates to that old creation under judgment. But... Paul saying those in the Christ will be made alive. Why? This is the new creation. Yeah? The old is gone, the new is here. I, uh, although I think it could be argued uh, that the, uh, 
the damned are raised uh, because of what Christ has done. This is not what Paul is meaning in this passage at all, I don't believe. You know, he's saying, in Adam, you're lost. But if you are in Christ, you're saved. So the, the Lord Jesus Christ could not be described as the first fruits of those who are still in Adam, whether they come back from the grave or not. You know, the unsaved dead could not be described as those who are asleep, which is the description of those who he's talking about in this passage. And more importantly, every time you find this statement in Christ within the New Testament, it only applies to believers. That's it. You know, you can't put unbelievers in it. Adam failed, but praise God, if you're, Paul says, in Christ, through grace, by faith, you'll live. So Paul's telling them all of this because in verse 23, he wants them to see that because of the first fruits of the harvest, the harvest is coming soon. And what does he say in verse 23? Each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So because Christ Jesus our Lord has risen as the first fruits, there will be the necessity uh, of a harvest one day. Yeah? You know, he says, each in turn, and what he's describing here, I think, uh, is that God has an order. You know, he has a sequence in his resurrection plan. Uh, the Bible teaches that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, would be in two parts. And we also have to believe, as we uh, study the scriptures, that the harvest itself will have uh, many parts as well. All right. Jesus said, uh, let's look at it. Jesus said, and John chapter 5, I read verse 29 a little while ago, but let's look at verses 28 and 29. Gospel of John, uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 28. Jesus, our Lord, said, A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. And, you know, you, you could think from reading that they're all, that, you know, everyone's just going to, you know, come forth uh, together at this one, one specific moment, some to life, others uh, to condemnation. But there is a sequence. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, we'll read verses 13 through 17. First Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13, it says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that those who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And you'll, you'll notice there, there's, there's no reference there to the resurrection of the unsaved dead. You know, the, the, there's no reference there to the resurrection of the damned. It's specific right there to believers. In, in other words, it's resurrection to life. It's resurrection to life. So if we were to look, I mentioned just briefly earlier, Revelation chapter 20. If we look at Revelation chapter 20, we see that the resurrection of uh, the dead who are unsaved, well, that comes uh, much later than anything that we just read together in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, verses uh, 11 through 15 of Revelation chapter 20, uh, John said, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is 
the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, as you, uh, uh, as you read the New Testament, uh, you know, whether, you know, wherever you're reading of, uh, you know, comforting words to the believer, you know, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you, don't, you don't read about anybody being lost. When you come to Revelation chapter 20, however, they're all lost. You know, it's a different period of time. That, uh, that great tribulation has come upon the whole earth. The millennial reign of Christ is over. You know, it's not talking about, you know, the imminent coming of the Lord that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, what we find here is that there are at least two resurrections the first to life and the second to death and nobody in that first resurrection will be lost and nobody in the second resurrection will be saved uh, and the you know, word of god just lays that out for us uh, now uh, there's also uh, the uh, resurrection of the old testament saints I do not have time uh, to get into that uh, this morning at all. Um, but, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested, uh, you can read about it. I can at least give you references. You can read the words of, uh, of Job in Job chapter 19. Uh, you can read uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, specifically verses 1 through 14. Uh, you could read Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, you could read Isaiah chapter uh, 26. And, uh, couldn't recall for you at the moment uh, the verses within that chapter, I'm sorry to say. And uh, I, can, I, can almost see, I can almost see Professor Donworth shaking his head at me. You know, my old Old Testament professor. You know, what do you mean it's in there? Should know where it is. Anyway, anyway, there's the there's the resurrection of the. Uh, <laughs> she, the smile. You remember how red his face used to turn when I would. I drove that man crazy. Anyway, that's a that's a different story. There's the resurrection of the uh, tribulation saints, and I think that res resurrection of the Old Testament saints will be at, at the same period of time. The resurrection of the tribulation saints. Uh, that we read of in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. Those who in those seven years of tribulation and, and judgment that's poured upon the earth will die, and at the end of those years will be resurrected, we're told. You know? But all of this to say, all the saints, whether it's the Old Testament saints, whether it's the tribulation saints, whether it's the saints in the, in the rapture of Jesus Christ, all of them comprise that first resurrection, which is resurrection to life. All right? Uh, again, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again, uh, verse 23. Each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. So that means if you're one of Christ's, you will be there uh, with the Lord in the first resurrection. You know, back to Revelation chapter 20, you know, for a moment. John says in verses 1 and 2 of that chapter, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. That's the millennial reign of Christ, right? You know, he continues in verses 3 and 4. He threw him into the abyss and locked him and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. That's the tribulation saints. 
They had not worshipped the beast or, or its image and, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Yeah, they, they were resurrected you know, after the tribulation and they lived and they reigned a thousand years with Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, this was their resurrection. That's what we find. Verses 5 and 6, it says, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. You know, uh, uh, now the, the rest of the dead... The unrighteous dead who were left in the grave, they didn't rise until the thousand years were ended. You know, John says this resurrection of these, you know, tribulation saints he's talking about is the first resurrection. Those who belong to Christ, those who follow the first fruits and that we read of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, so the good news is if you're Christ's today, you're Christ this morning, you will follow. You will follow. You know, Paul says, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, then the end will come, okay, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Then the end will come. The end of what? You know, what's, what's coming? You know, some people think that means the end of the... Uh, the end of the resurrection. You know, Christ has come. The dead in Christ have been raised. Those that are alive have, have gone to be with the Lord. And the tribulation saints. And after the tribulation will have risen again. The Old Testament saints. And then at the very end after, you know, uh, you know the dead who are outside of Christ have risen again. Then that's it. That'll be the end of the, the resurrections. But, but, but look. No, no. Look. Look at what Paul tells us is the end. It's when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. You know, what's this kingdom that the Lord Jesus is, you know, described as delivering there up to the Father? Well, I, I guess there's a sense in which this kingdom is spiritual, yeah? And those who acknowledge the, uh, the lordship of, of Christ and, and happily, gladly surrender to God's rule in their hearts are part of that kingdom of God. And then in another sense, uh, you know, the, the kingdom is that literal uh, rule of Christ on this earth. So, you know, you remember that the uh, angel said to Mary, going back to Christmas time, we all have to smile a little bit when we think about it. Luke chapter 1. 32 and 33. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So the Lord Jesus would absolutely be the one who would sit on the throne of David during that millennial kingdom that we read of there in Revelation chapter 20, the thousand years when Christ will rule with that rod of iron. But even after that reign of righteousness on the earth, everything's not yet put under that subjection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20 again, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right, let's look at it. Uh, Revelation 20, beginning in verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of, of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. So what we find is that the Lord Jesus puts the devil, you know, down for the final time. He casts him into the lake of fire 
and all of his angels and all the lost who will follow him. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, we read, after he delivers death and Hades to the lake of fire, he does what? He delivers the kingdom of, you know, the whole kingdom to God, the Father. And the Lord Jesus delivers everything in this beautiful and this perfect state to his Father God upon the throne. And praise God, he ushers in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Uh, which is the eternal state. Uh, so, you know, the word for end there in uh, verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 15 is telos. Okay? Uh, and that Greek word, it, it, it cannot only refer to that which is uh, final, but uh, completed, the final culmination of all the ages. So, so the kingdom here is, is not only the millennial kingdom that we read about, but, you know, because even after this millennial, even after that millennial kingdom, there's still this chaotic uh, abuse of the evil one. But what's being offered up to God here as a kingdom is this, this middle, this, uh, you know, mediatorial kingdom where everything will be in harmony, you know, with the sovereign will of God. And then at that point, Christ will offer it to him. Uh, which is, you know, but why? You know, I, you know uh, it, it, Paul tells us right there in 1 Corinthians 15, right at the end of our, our text this morning, that God may be all in all, you know? So, again, our minds are cast back to uh, Adam in the Garden uh, of Eden, and he gave the evil one, the authority over the world and then the Lord Jesus in heaven said I'll go I will go uh, and I will bleed and I will die I will take the sin of the world upon my shoulders I'll be buried I will come to life uh, again I will go to my father's right hand and I will intercede for those people throughout their throughout their whole existence throughout their whole pilgrimage on earth I'll do that, you know, and you know, there's a, there's a day coming. I have no idea when none of us do, but there is a day coming after the tribulation, after the rapture, after the millennial reign. And, you know, just at the, it'll be, it'll be just at the very borders of that eternal state, right? You know, that we read of in those final chapters of revelation where Christ will have put everything underneath his feet and given all back to God. In other words, uh, it'll be a perfect ending. Uh, isn't that what we want? Uh, you know, the purpose is that God, as Paul says, may be all in all. God may be all in all. Paul tells us in verses 25 and 26 why that has to happen. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And, um, you know, there's a, there was a painting uh, by a, a German artist, and it was, uh, uh, it was originally entitled the, uh, the Chess Player. Some come, came to know it as, uh, as a checkmate, uh, Moritz was his first name, uh, Rauch, Rauch, I don't know, uh, was the last name of that artist. It was a painting that hung in the Louvre at, in Paris at one time. Uh, I think it was actually sold into a private collection back in, uh, back in 1999. But that's just a bonus for you. But if you, if you were to look at it, you know, it, it, it's this painting and it's depicting this young man playing a game of chess with the devil. And so you may be familiar with this. And the devil, apparently, you know, by the position of his chess pieces, he's won the game. And you can see it in the painting, the smile on his face, like he's got this, you know. But, uh, but one day, uh, so it is said, uh, a noted chess player was walking by this uh, portrait in the museum in which it was displayed. And after studying the piece, he, 
suddenly cried out, I mean cried out from the depths of his soul, I can save this fellow. He saw it. And he explained how the chess pieces could be moved to win the game. And I think that's brilliant, you know, because that is what the Lord Jesus has done. We were in the Adam, right? We were in Adam and we were doomed and damned and judged, but he's moved the devil who, who, who had checkmated us. He moved him and he's just snatched the, it, it, it's like snatching the prey from the jaws of the grave. He defeated death. He conquered death. And he had to, you know, he had to reign till that day. And that's the whole answer here. Until he put under his feet the last enemy that would be destroyed, Paul says, and that would be death. And praise God that he's conquered death and hell. Because going back to the very beginning of our, of our text this morning, he, he is indeed arisen. You know, it, it's, it's all real. It, you know, all of this that I said this morning, I mean, there are a great many out there who would hear it and just consider it a fable. You know, all it would be would be a fairy tale to their ears. But friends, for those who believe, for those who follow this faith, for those of us who are in Christ, it's so much more. I, granted, I know the world could kind of creep into our hearts and our minds and we can begin to think that, come on, it's all too fantastical. It's just a, just a dream. You know, just the, maybe, maybe it is the hope of a doomed people, but I think not. This hope of the resurrection, it's real. You know, if Christ rise from the dead and was raised from the dead, and he did, as Paul declares, then we too, as believers, will indeed arise as well one day. But we will follow as members of that first resurrection. And what a group that's comprised in that group. I mean, man, uh, to be part of that. Incredible. So uh, well, we thank our Lord this morning. Quite amazed that I even finished by uh, by this time, but well, thankful for that too, I suppose. Let's go to the Lord as we uh, uh, as we wrap up this morning. I mean, Lord, we just—it's incredible uh, it, to know uh, that death, hell, the grave, uh, all of it. The evil one himself uh, have been you know, vanquished, conquered. It's to know that victory a as a believer, and to know that we will be with you forevermore. I mean, that ought to bring us, all of us, some encouragement. It ought to bring to all of us who've been fearful some courage. <laughs> it should bring to us uh, you know, who are doubtful, you know, when we read these words, some certainty, you know, that this is to be, that this is how things really are, as the word tells us, you know, uh, and Lord, I, I do hope that in our hearts we know it. I know Paul was just reaching out, just crying out to the, to the church so that they'd believe not not part of it, but all of it. You know that that they're a part of this. That they would, as as the people of God, be the ones to follow the first of the harvest. And uh, we too, as the church today, can know this. Uh, that great resurrection, that great and mighty resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, the first fruits, and then us to follow. I just. It's amazing, Lord. I, I know that our hearts would, uh, the part of our hearts that kind of cling to the world and cling to our, you know, even our own flesh, you know, that, that's where doubt creeps in and we start to, we almost start to think it sounds too, too amazing, too, too much like a fable, like a fairy tale, just a story. But, you know, it's, it's the spirit you know, holding on to our hearts that tells us otherwise. 
and that opens our eyes, the eyes of faith, to realize that, no, this is so much more. Uh, this, is, this is what it is to be a follower of Christ. This is what's coming for the follower of Christ. May, may we hold on to it. May it be something that lifts our heads above, above everything that we see around us, any chaos and troubles and trials and problems that come our way. And so that we're able to see up and beyond uh, because there's so much more ahead. Uh, Lord, thank you for being with us each step of the way on this pilgrimage. For not leaving us alone, but for guiding us through it. May we continue to look to you as our light and as our source of life as we walk through this world. And may we carry that message as we go through it, proclaiming your name. Preaching, because our preaching is not in vain. Uh, it's, it's going to make a difference. And may we see lives transformed. May we see these seats filled with people who are hungry for your word, like those who are here this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.